Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Suman Trainees Committee. I'm Marina Papazotu. I'm Rosalinda Weibro. We hope that you all enjoyed our previous episode in which we discussed blockchain and its implications across Europe. Today we are discussing gender equality, focusing specifically on countering gender discrimination on the workplace, sexual harassment, as well as other global feminist issues. We're really pleased to be joined today here by MEP Ernest Erteson. He's a member of the Greens EFA group and also coordinator and member of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee. And he's also a reporter for equality between women and men in the European Parliament. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting. So, there are very few men on the FEM committee. Mm -hmm. How did you yourself become interested in advocacy and gender equality issues? Well, my party, uh, the Greens in Catalonia, uh, have uh, the feminism and gender equality as one of their main flags, main topics. And it was my commitment uh, during my campaign uh, to make uh, of this one of my priorities. And that is, that, that is why when I arrived and I was elected in 2014, uh, normally the MEPs, when they arrive, they need to choose two, three committees where they want to work. That's why one of my, my uh, elections was, uh, was uh, the Gender Equality Committee, which is a very important committee because not only we do legislation in terms of gender equality, but we always also try to mainstream uh, the policies of, uh, of, different, of the other committees. And, uh, and I think it's very important. That is, that is why I'm very proud to be a member of that committee. That is indeed very interesting. So let's talk about gender equality in the workplace. Mm. Uh, looking at gender representation, even here in the parliament, we see that more men occupy senior positions, particularly at director level posts. In your opinion, how can we tackle gender discrimination in the workplace and also get more women into more managerial positions? Uh, there are two aspects. Well, there are different aspects of that, but two that are very important. First is discrimination at the level of pay, the so-called pay gap. Uh, and this is something we need to tackle. We have a, um, a work plan to tackling uh, gender pay gap at European level, but it's, it's rather weak. Uh, here we need to see the countries that are doing the things good, like for instance Iceland that has created just a new law which uh, obliges all companies to be fully transparent about uh, the, the wage grid in the company, so you can immediately see if there's any kind of discrimination. This effort of transparency is something that I think should be replicated in all, in all the European Union and would be an important important measure to tackle gender pay gap. And then there's the other aspect, which is, as you said, the participation of women in managerial positions. Uh, well, first, if we talk of public institution and politics, I think that, well, we have advanced a bit, but there's a lot to do. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong defender of, uh, of quotas because I think positive discrimination helps overcoming uh, discrimination towards women, so this is one measure. And then, for instance, if you take uh, big companies, which is another problem, like the lack of a managerial position for women in big companies, we have a directive now which is being discussed in the Council called Women's On Board, which wants to establish also quotas for women in the big managerial positions. And this is something that Norway has adopted and it works very well. So those are measures that could be taken and that would help a lot making women more present in managerial positions, both in institutions and in private companies. I see. And you also recently tweeted, and I'm quoting, men in this country owe it to our mothers and grandmothers to do for our sons and our daughters what they have done for us. And I'm asking this because this tweet was referring to a new law on equal and non-transferable maternity and paternity yes. leave. So maybe that could be a way to alleviate you know, some problems that women face in the workplace. So in your opinion, what else can be done? That's very important because we know that and it happens all over Europe that uh, an, uh, the, uh, an employer, when is going to hire a man or a woman, it immediately thinks whether she is going to get pregnant. This is totally unacceptable, but why does it happen? Well, basically because we have laws that give uh, the possibility for maternity leave, but we don't have laws that put paternity leave compulsory at the same level. So if at the moment of the, of the birth of the child, both men and women would assume at the same level of burden when it takes uh, taking care of the kid and taking leave, it would, we will immediately kill the discrimination at the labor market. That is why I'm a strong defender of non-transferable equal uh, paternity and maternity leaves. 
Uh, we are far away from that. Maybe in, in Spain we would legislate that in the coming, in the coming months. It would be very good. At the, at the level of, of the EU, what we are trying is at least to have minimum standards on paternity leave because there are countries at the moment that have no provisions in terms of paternity leave. That means that uh, fathers do not take not even one single day of leave. And this is totally unacceptable because we need to, to share that. And uh, we are now discussing the Work-Life the work Balance Directive. Uh, it's going to be voted tomorrow here in Parliament where, among other things, we want to establish minimum paternity leave for all EU countries. And this would be a measure that would alleviate this discrimination. So this is very important that tomorrow we vote that and that that we uh, managed to have a strong text uh, at the end with the, with the Council as well. You also advocated for change during the Me Too hashtag mm -hmm. debate in Parliament. So um, do you think that the Me Too movement will have a lasting impact and what else can we do to change people's perceptions and attitudes towards sexual and street harassment? I think it had an impact because the problem is that harassment was, uh, was uh, was happening in absolute impunity and silence and at least this issue of, of breaking the silence and of creating um, a solidarity between women like uh, when 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 uh, a woman uh, says that she has been assaulted sexually uh, there is this solidarity with the Me Too movement that has been created that we believe you we know this is happening because we have been suffering that as well and this I think at least we are talking about that even in this house you know that in this house, uh, after the Me Too movement, there, ha there has been uh, women that have also started to speak about problems with sexual harassment in this house. And now we have the board of the parliament working on a specific work plan to tackle sexual harassment in the European Parliament. So, of course, it had an effect. And I think that the most important thing is that now this movement turns into laws so that really we have measures to, talk, to, to, take, to tackle sexual harassment. And for instance, in this house, in the parliament, we are now advocating for an external audit about uh, is the institution really taking seriously the issue. We want also a mechanism where women that are sexually assaulted or harassed can go and complain and that this, this mechanism works effectively. So there, there are a certain number of measures that we also want to establish in this house. So really I think the Me Too movement was extremely important and I think a lot of women feel now more confident in speaking, uh, uh, in speaking out when they suffer something like that and this is very, very positive. Yeah, really, really important. Um, you also recently tweeted your support for the European Parliament's proposed humanitarian visa mm -hmm. and in particular the assistance that this would offer to exactly. female refugees. So uh, could you explain to us a little bit how the refugee crisis disproportionately affects women? The problem we had is that, uh, well, uh, refugees uh, from coming from Syria and from other places, uh, since there were no legal routes to enter the European Union, they had to take uh, illegal routes uh, via smugglers. So we analyzed, and there was a report done in the Parliament about this, what happened to women in these illegal routes and when they were in the hands of smugglers. And we identified uh, how, for instance, many women were forced into prostitution in order to be smuggled to the European Union, where even in, uh, in, uh, in a place like, like, uh, like uh, refugee camps inside the, Euro the European Union, uh, we had cases of rape, of sexual assault. So th there was really a, a, pro a problem uh, that was not being addressed by the, um, by, by the EU institutions. And that is why when we were discussing the humanitarian visas, uh, we thought it was an extremely important tool, particularly for women, because by creating legal routes for refugees into the EU, we are actually alleviating the, the suffering of women that are the, the ones that suffer the most in the transit with smugglers. And that is why I think we need to be, uh, we need to be very strong on that. And I think also that uh, this issue has been completely forgotten in the last years. Everybody has been talking about refugees, mm -hmm. but the issue of the specificity of women refugees was not really debated. And I think it's very important that we raise that issue and that we fight to stop that uh, violence against women, also for refugees. Oh, so keeping this in mind, how does the EU actually collaborate with other institutions and maybe non-governmental organizations to combat human trafficking? Well, I think that um, uh, one of the things that we have been asking the EU first is to push for legal routes, that is very important, but also, uh, for instance, the EU has the capacity to monitor uh, uh, the hotspots, so the places where the refugees arrive in the first place, and also the, re the, 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 the places where the refugees are, uh, uh, are uh, hosted when they arrive to the EU. So uh, what we advocated a lot is that in cooperation also with, uh, with uh, UNHCR and the other UN agencies that work in the place, that 
there are effective mechanisms to protect women put in place. And there are very simple issues, for instance, to make in, the, in those camps to create places where women and men sleep in different places. This is something very basic that, uh, that uh, everybody could understand is very important, but it's not happening. So these are very concrete measures that we uh, proposed in the report that I mentioned uh, about uh, women, uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, how the refugee crisis was, was affecting women. So really those measures need to be put in place and we're still a bit far away from that. So we are still continue fighting for this. And also we can help but notice that these crimes that you mentioned, such as uh, sexual harassment, abuse, forced marriages, even um, which are perpetrated against women on a global scale, um, are being reported to private organizations and NGOs only and not to national governments. So there is currently no coherent EU-wide system to actually collect data on these cases. So the collection of data might actually be the key to prevent future incidents and facilitate, establish a certain network to support the victims. Could you give us maybe an idea how, what does the EU plan to do on that front? Well, in the front of having mechanisms, so efficient mechanisms to, uh, that, that women can, can announce, well, the problem is that we have uh, very different situations depending on every member state. Uh, there are some member states where we actually do have effective uh, mechanisms for women that have been uh, uh, um, uh, victims of violence of, of, or, or sexual assault, where more or less it works. It has to do a lot with uh, having civil servants, particularly in police, who are ready to detect these kind of situations and they can receive women that have been victims. There are countries that do that very well. In other countries, it is true that uh, there is a very lack, uh, a complete lack of, uh, of, of training on the side of civil servants, and it's mainly organizations doing that. So I think they are, uh, we have been calling for that, that we need, particularly on this matter, uh, the issue of training of civil servants is very important. And here, a program at, at the level of the European Union will be very, very important in order to make sure that, uh, that, that, that all, uh, all polices for instance, have specific units uh, to, uh, to, co to combat, but also to be able to receive a victim when she is a victim and, 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 and accommodate their needs. So I think that the, the problem is that we have very different situations at the, at, the, at, the, at the level of member states, and it's true that we are lacking a bit of coherence. And this is also true for the, for the collection of data, because we don't have an effective system where, where women can go and... Um, and complain. Uh, we also are lacking good data about uh, about uh, um, about um, uh, gender-based violence, and this is something because policies are very much uh, uh, leaded when you have good data and you can identify good the phenomena. And it's true that we don't have uh, yet good data to combat that phenomena. So this is also another front that we need to work uh, to, that we are working on. So uh, finally, beyond the European Parliament and the European Union, um, how would you encourage young people and particularly young men to get involved with grassroots advocacy and campaigns on gender equality? I, I think that it's very important that men and young men understand that gender equality is not a matter only for women. This is uh, something that affects everybody. And the most important thing is a cultural change. I mean, we men need to stand ready to complain or to correct certain attitudes that we see in our daily lives, like uh, 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 comments, jokes, uh, um, also uh, issues that we see, uh, scenes of harassment that we can see in our daily lives. And, and thing I, I think here that uh, the participation and involvement of men are essential. And we need to understand women's issue is not something that only uh, relates to women, but also to men. And, and of course, I would, well, if, if there are if there are young men that are listening to me, I would say, well, the first thing is like to be uh, an active, uh, um, an active, uh, um, in engaged person in terms of gender equality in your daily life. And of course, if you're going to go even far away from that and being engaged in civil society movements for gender equality, I think this is also very important. For instance, in my country, you probably know in Spain we had this strike. Of, uh, of women, that was very important. And I was very happy to see a lot of young men taking part in that demonstration. And I think this is the way, the way forward. And um, 
And also we need to be aware that sometimes we believe that the younger generations are more uh, prepared to assume gender equality or that are more conscious that gender equality matters. And this is actually not true. We need, to be, we need to be aware that the fight for gender equality is a fight of every generation. And if we, are not, if we do not continue that fight, things will get worse. We need to be aware of that. So it's very important that we all uh, are personally engaged in, uh, um, in favor of gender equality in all uh, different aspects of life. Thanks. Well, that is That's unfortunately really all the time we have. Thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us and discuss this very interesting topic. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for our viewers for tuning in to our final episode um, of the podcasts. And we really hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, like I said, it's the last one produced by our spring 2018 trainees, but we really hope that our successors are going to continue our efforts. So stay tuned for some more episodes in late autumn. On behalf of all of us from the Suman Trainees Committee, thank you for watching and goodbye.